Welcome back to Recurrent Events, episode four. I have with me my esteemed colleague, as usual, Mr. Wesley Shantz, and with us special guest, Mr. David Oldham. Uh, Hello. Welcome. Hello. Hey. And how's so, it going? yeah, how's it going, Oldham? And uh, well, Good. before I even ask that, let me, let me let me lay down who David Oldham is. So he's our friend from graduate school. He has the same master's degree from St. John's as uh, both Wes and I do, but he also has a couple additional degrees too. Uh, while having studied classics at Xavier University in Ohio, Cincinnati, where I think he was recently for a wedding, um, Oldham then pursued his master's in liberal arts at St. John's, then another master's in education at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee, and then uh, uh, you recently got your Juris Doctor, your your law degree from- Hold on, I think Nashville, my audio's cut out. Nashville School of Law. Yeah, and um, and then you just passed the bar as well, right? Yes, fortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember being there over the summer and you being sweating at some, but I think it's the sort of test that probably it's best to sweat, from what I hear. But during it's, all this, if time, you're not sweating, you're. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely one of the ones. If you're if you're not worried about it, then you're in trouble. But you know, I think the most interesting thing about this, uh, Mr. Oldham, uh, Esquire is that um, a Sir Oldham, I guess you are now, you really earned the title, is uh, that you've been working the whole time. You've been a teacher the entire time you've been doing all of your graduate work. Isn't that so? You've, uh, during your master's yeah. at John's education. And so I know that we wanted to ask you a little bit about your current teaching situation, but I, I guess I'm going to ask, ask you, what's that been like? You know, teaching work the whole time that you were pursuing higher education and you know why were you pursuing higher education if you already had a teaching job and yeah you know what what led you to this yeah that's 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 an excellent question um and it's definitely one that's uh sort of like bled into all of my classes over the last <clears throat> oh gosh since when did i start at st john's 2012 um, why, you know, why continue with school while I'm still teaching or already teaching and have a job? And I guess, um, it was, well, I guess the, the nature of it was that it was obviously uh, relatively difficult. Um, the, just the time, the sheer amount of time getting up at, you know, five thirty or so and going to class till 10 o'clock a few days a week and then the workload. Um, but I, I think to be quite honest, like, um, even though it was, uh, difficult, it, it benefited me. I mean, obviously, like you both are very familiar with uh, the benefit of um, the nature of St. John's. Um, I think we're all better teachers because of the experience we had there and because of um, sort of what that ingrained in our nature. And I think even though law school at night was very difficult, it was very beneficial as well to feel, you know, what it's like to still be a student because as I'm teaching Latin or you know, philosophy or whatever, um, you know, knowing what it's like to be going through the struggle as well allowed me to connect better with my students. Did they look up to you more when they know that you're also, you know, studying and working hard um, in the same kind of way that they are? Oh, I, I, I definitely would say so. Yeah, they, they, uh, they appreciate it. I think they, they knew that I wasn't just, you know, standing there and just, just saying things either to get paid or because I'd found my way into the job. Um, they knew that I was, you know, invested in learning because yeah, I told them about my experience in law school and how difficult it was and how difficult I knew Latin was. Um, but that I knew that both things that what I was studying, what they were studying was beneficial because I'd done the same thing at their age. Well, so that's really interesting to me because something that's part of this segment in particular and something that's sort of a mm -hmm. perennial discussion between Wes and me is sort of the tension between the pursuit, the pursuit of civic virtue for its own sake mm -hmm. and yeah. the pursuit of sort of capitalist fortune. And, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm obviously very much on the side of uh, capitalism, uh, but I, I also have a sense of civic virtue, and that's something we've talked about. Right some on this show and um, and so that's just very interesting to me that you would actually be practically motivated to pursue additional education at your own expense of time, yeah. energy, stress, 
uh, you know, and, and just money, money being the biggest, yeah. obviously, um, that right. notified money. Uh, but why would it be so important? Is it? Are you actually saying that it was so important to you to have credibility or to be a role model to these kids that you put yourself through additional personal, financial, temporal, uh, you know, stress? Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. <clears throat> and I, I think even more so than, than the law degree, I think that goes back to the St. John's. I've, I, I'll never forget being a senior in undergrad and talking with the professor a philosophy who'd, who'd gone to St. John's and I was, there I was, a you know, majoring in Greek Latin philosophy and I talked to him about being interested in the school and he said, well, you got to ask your oneself or yourself one question. Um, do you, do you feel done learning? And I said, well, heck no. And he said, well, then you definitely need to consider going to St. John's. And I think that's, you know, the sort of intention with which we all went to that school and, and very much what makes us, whatever we are of good teachers, that it, it takes that sort of inclination, um, if that makes sense. I think I'm following that. Like, what I felt strongly studying things at St. John's was my own ignorance. Like, maybe mm. for the first time that really came home to me, as I would sit there and open my mouth to say something and realize halfway through what I was saying that, I had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and I really, really hoped that someone else would be able to pick up the thread and, and maybe point to something in the book that we had all read, you know, which mm. again was like a pretty unique thing about St. John's. Like, well, everyone actually read, read the books as, as far as I could tell. So I, I thought that there was an obvious question in, in what was asked too was like, so getting this law degree, did you do that just because you wanted to keep learning stuff or do you want to be a lawyer? Uh, both. I, <laughs> it was my um, first year teaching where I teach now. Um, I've been there. This is my fifth year or sixth year now. And it's a public high school. It's the most diverse uh, high public high school in the state. And it's, it's got its challenges. By far, I think it's one of the better public high schools in Metro Nashville. Um, but it's, uh, it, it was enough of a stress that I realized that it's not the sort of thing that um, would be able to support uh, a long-term life, like having a family, living in this city. And already that's the case. The city is, Nashville's grown to such a, a rapid extent that um, you can't be a starting teacher and live here. They've like even uh, talked about it on the news that if you're a first-time home buyer in Nashville, you've got to look outside the city. And they've not given, teacher, give, uh, given teachers increased pay, uh, enough to support living here and I, I, I could see that coming already even back then and that was a big part of my decision the other was the stressor and the stress of you know randomly having to break up fights or dealing with student disrespect or a lack of um, uh, adequate disciplinary responses from the administration which are not you know super prevalent but it was enough to <laughs> make me think well is this a long-term viable uh, career path, or should I look to something that's going to um, challenge me intellectually, but also support me financially? Um, and um, where, whereas teaching does certainly challenge me intellectually and fulfill me um, emotionally, I think with, with everything, I, um, I, I I see it as well uh, as a, um, in the law as being an answer to this, that problem. Well, and just to maybe paint a picture of you to the listeners here, and I do hope that many of our friends and the people we know in Tennessee get a chance to hear this and get a chance yeah. to hear one of, you know, their emerging leading citizens uh, and what he has to say about this sort of thing. But uh, uh, I think the understanding of the sort of person you are that might lead you to study Latin and the law because of its Latin mm -hmm. Roman roots and mm -hmm. something that per perhaps You'll, you'll think appropriate here is I do know that you are very much Catholicly uh, uh, educated as well as mm -hmm. you are very much a staunch Catholic. And mm -hmm. that um, you are currently at this moment, are you seated in a place that you call a study surrounded by <laughs> books with a globe that has a bar inside of it? It most definitely does. It's, it's uh, right here beside <laughs> my armchair. And uh, all I have to do is open it up. It's got a, 
sea monsters on it and it's um <laughs> old wood looking and um yeah i've got my everything i need there <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful do you have it. a do you have a tumbler with some manner of cocktail of course. <laughs> Anytime good. I sit in this chair. <laughs> well, you know, maybe if we have you as a recurrent guest, you can tell us what the cocktail of the week is. What is it this time? I like that. It's uh, a bit of a uh, tequila uh, and mineral water and uh, lime juice with a couple slices of jalapenos. Okay. That's, that's, that sounds very much wonderful. And if you were my teacher, that would be another thing I'd be impressed by, even if I didn't <laughs> think about you. But um, uh, two, two things just to get serious really fast. It is unfortunate mm -hmm. that you don't see education as a long-term viable option. Even, yes. I would ask, even through the administration role, and if not through administration, why not? And then two, I wanted to mention to the listeners that you are at a charter school. That's correct, right? Uh, I'm at a regular public high school. Okay, so it's not a charter school. Okay, correct. was it at some point yes. a charter school? Uh, <clears throat> no, it's, it's just a super... Um, diverse public high school. It's, okay. Um, okay. It's a, yeah. Well, that actually, that I think helps then because then you could not actually go in the district to a higher paying job as a teacher, like a charter school teacher could. But um, yeah. the, sec the second thing I, I think is just sort of sad is that uh, you, not sad so much as it, it says something about if one wants to grow as an educator, how one has to grow beyond the classroom in a traditional sense. Right. Because obviously I'm doing this online thing now. Wes is subbing after having been a full-time teacher and doing online mm. things and now managing. Uh, now I guess I should congratulate Wes too, now managing Signum Academy. One of the, oh, congrats. From what I understand is the the sort of young young adult and children's branch of Signum University and trying, wow. to, trying to, you know, do something with that, doing something special with that. Um, but that we're all sort of pursuing education in these, these um, differing ways. But um, mm. we, you can either comment on that, but I, I also would like for you, if Wes, if Wes also thinks this is interesting, sort of just walk us through what a typical day at your school is, and then maybe just sort of tell us some general facts that you would tell somebody at a coffee shop about your school just to give us an idea because I think we all three currently have very differing experiences in the classroom and mm. ha have had very different experiences in the classroom and I think it's important for people just to sort of understand the diversity of environments to say the least. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I, I teach at, um, it's like, like I said, a super diverse public high school. Um, a lot of students are, we've got, um, oh gosh, I, I can't remember the specifics of how many languages, like uh, tens and tens of languages, students from all over the world. Um, I think uh, every year we even have a student, or at least last year we had a student who they didn't even know what language the student spoke. They could not figure out what language the student spoke somewhere in the, the, like, the Pacific <laughs> Islands area. And, um, I shouldn't be laughing, but I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. No, yeah, that's, yeah. Can you imagine trying to teach? You know, having this kid come in and they don't even know what language the students speak. <laughs> <And> so <I've, laughs> we've got kids who, you know, who go to Vanderbilt every year. We've got kids who barely speak English, and I've got you know these students in my some not in my Latin classes certainly, but in perhaps like my um, world religion class or my philosophy class, and I'm responsible for uh, tiering my or structuring my learning to uh, benefit not only the Vanderbilt uh, um, aspiring students, but also these students who barely speak English. Um, so it's definitely got a challenge, but as far as um, how that fits into my day, I teach. So on one day, I'll teach, we're on an A-B schedule um, and 90 minute classes. And we've got about 2,000 right under 2,000 students. Uh, we're in an area of Nashville that's kind of in between uh, the super wealthy part of Brentwood and um, a, a, a more of a developing part, I guess, uh, where a lot of the immigrant population um, lives. And um, I teach, I was hired to teach Latin uh, and I teach Latin one through three. And um, I also teach a law class that I've started this year which is run through, um, run as a, what they call a youth court. So it's a part of the juvenile court system. 
And these students go through a training at the beginning of the year and um, they are, they basically, uh, if an individual at this high school where I teach gets in trouble, they get picked up by the police or something, um, the juvenile court offers them, if it's a, perhaps a misdemeanor, a small offense, to go through the uh, youth court program. So they'll get tried by the their peers, which are the students in my class. They'll have student attorneys who basically run a sentencing hearing, which is basically a trial. We have attorneys come in and act as a judge and um, advisors for the prosecution and defense. And they sentence their fellow student to um, a repercussion, which is like um, volunteer hours or whatever. Um, so it's, got, it's part of the restorative practice pursuit in the um, juvenile court. Uh, so that's, that's one, one of the classes that I teach. And then I also teach um, a world religion class, which our current principal had me write a couple of years ago and um, be part of the purpose for which was to encourage dialogue amongst our students um, being so diverse. And then I also teach two segments of uh, philosophy, which is kind of a general history of philosophy, which is also a class that I wrote uh, for our high school for Metro. So, Do they pay yeah. you extra to write this curriculum? <laughs> No, <laughs> I wish you, you'd think they would, right? Um, I had to, I asked, you know, it, yeah. I asked it optimistically, but I didn't really think they would. Sorry, right. no, right? Yeah, <laughs> I wish, but again, I wish, but, ag but again, why would you do that for free? I th so that I could teach it, it wasn't yeah. there, and I kept telling the principals, I want to teach philosophy, and uh, they um. They said, all right, you write it, you propose it, we'll send it in. If they approve it, then we'll let you teach it. And so they you approved the it. And yeah. You do all the yeah. work and you can do the work. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> which I don't, I don't say cynically. I just think that that's such prima facie evidence of the fact of civic virtue and its importance mm. In, mm. in our schools. Because, I mean, this is very conceptual, the things you're saying, but please, why don't you tell me how many people are in your class and your classes and, and do they have cell phones out and oh, uh, how many, and what is, what is it like managing your classes? And maybe you can yeah. just get a story about that. And you said, you even talked about breaking up fights. Oh yeah. So I kind of yeah. want to know a little bit about those parts of your day and how prevalent really? those are as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I start when I started teaching. I had all classes, about thirty-five kids a class. Um, it it would start in the year with maybe thirty-six, thirty-seven, but they whittle that down to thirty-five somehow. Um, and um, that's about what it's at this year, except for Latin. Latin, it's it's about half. Oh, well, not half that. It's probably twenty-two, twenty-three in Latin one. And part of that is because I um, <laughs> I've I've made the Latin more difficult. Um, and that's that's inevitably shrunk the the number of students signing up for and passing on into the Latin two. Uh, so right now I just have one section of Latin one and one section of Latin two and three, and two and three are both in the same class. And that's about thirty three students, I think, all both together. My other classes, though, tend to be about thirty five students, um, maybe one or two less because it's rare to have a full class there. Usually, one or stu two students is missing per class. And, for various reasons, um, but uh, it's uh, that's just part of the nature of the game. They've our our school has been on a push to lower the number of students in sort of STEM classes, but that means that the uh, all of the other classes get uh, more students. So I I being you know the philosophy and well uh, religions teacher and whatnot get all of those extras, uh, but I take it. And, and as far as cell phones, it's a uh, Oh, it's a constant struggle. It's just, it's constant. I mean, the repercussions are you can, you know, you tell the student to put it away. And if they respect you, they will, which usually my students put it away. But then it's back out five minutes later. And the, the problem with, uh, f like, fighting it strongly is that you have to write a student up. You try to take it up. Sometimes they'll refuse to give it to you. Then that becomes a dispute. And it really is more of a hassle than it's worth. It's a lot easier to just let a student be distracted and fail the class than it is to take, you know, 10 or 20 minutes away from every class to I argue with them uh, uh, at the um, detriment to everyone else's education. So it's 10 or really 20 a, minutes? Really? 10 I mean, or 20? 
It, it can be. Uh, we, had a, we had a teacher, it was either last year or the year before, and he quit three days in because he told a, uh, an individual to put their phone away and they just started cursing him out. And he, he just immediately quit, um, which is, you know, not any situation that I've ever been in. But um, it's, it's more of a pick your battles kind of thing. And um, I, I find it a lot easier to just say, hey, listen, um, I, I'll tell you to put it away once or twice, but in the end, the students who have their phones out fail. And they, they've learned that by, by the end of the first semester. All right, so fighting. This happens ah. in class or in the hall <laughs> or after school. I mean, what, what's going on with, uh, I can understand yeah. the phones thing, but, but like, uh, is the fighting a regular thing or? or? Um, I'll, I'll hear about them. I've broken up at least one fight every year, except for not that, not yet this year. Cross, cross your fingers. Knock on wood. Um, Crossed. Last year we had a bit of a, uh, from my understanding, it was a, a, a gang related fight um, between, I believe, a, um, well, two different racial groups and um, they were all freshmen though. So it was more like a, like they were trying to be in the gang. Anyway, it was, it was serious enough for us, our school to go on lockdown, but it's interesting because the teachers rushed in. Like we all heard it and we all just right, ran right toward it. We made a, a human chain. <laughs> we didn't talk it out. We just, we just naturally jumped together and separated the students. And uh, um, then they went on lockdown for a, a, an hour and a half or so. Um, well, I just want to understand but, that behavior a little bit. So you put yourself yeah. in physical harm's way just to keep them from harming each other and their futures. Yeah, it wasn't very smart. <laughs> we just did yeah, it. But, we didn't. Yeah, but maybe it was, you know? It's yeah. like you were protecting the future by making that. Yeah. Yeah. Like that I like that way of looking at it. Yeah. Well, it's like it was natural to all of you. Like, it wasn't even a mm -hmm. question you said. Like, you just, it's not like you received training to create a human shield. No. It's like it would not be legal to require that of you. Yeah. Oh, not at all. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting how and in that moment when you're uh, you kind of go into that well you definitely go into that fight or flight. Um, my my first fight I broke up. I've and like I said I've I've broken up about one or two every year. And my first one was I was going to to lunch and uh, saw it down the hallway and I kind of looked over and there was another young teacher, a little bit bigger and taller than me, even, but um, about my age. And he said, "All right, let's do it." And we just ran right into it. Both grabbed the student and pulled him back. And you know when you're grabbing a uh, you know, a teenager, 17 or 18, they're pretty tall, pretty big. And it takes all the energy you got to just hold them back. Um, but it's, and it's always for various reasons. A lot of times it's uh, girls or boys or um, you know, can be uh, gang related or turf related or whatever, but it's, it's always something different, but it's always kind of the same. Two, two things about that. When you engage, do you always say, hey, 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 first, hey, three times, and B, <laughs> is it exciting to break up? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like a, it's, it's exciting insofar as like um, scary news is exciting. Like it's, it gets your heart going. It's, it's not something that you look forward to, um, but it's, it's, uh, it definitely get, grabs your attention. Uh, it's also something you, you don't that. forget. With a headed out, yeah. Every every single one I remember very vividly. Um, but it's what, it's uh, it's always what's it worrisome. Like, what's it like with the students afterwards? Has it ever been with a student that you've had? Do you talk to them afterwards? Do you ever see them again? What's it? What is it like interacting with somebody that you've had to mm. you know, restrain before? Yeah, that's um. It's never been with the only. I came close to having two students start to fight in one of my classes. Um, and that was something that I just uh, very quickly nipped in the bud. Um, so it never, it didn't go to, you know, it didn't reach the level of fisticuffs, <laughs> but, um, uh, it's, yeah. So I've never had to deal with the, the full aftermath because it's only really been with students who I've not had in my classes, fortunately. Um, well, that what? may also speak to, you know, you as a teacher, uh, but Wes, sorry. Maybe so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned a little earlier about the uh, restorative practices, which yes. I think is, is pretty much nationwide is the sense I get right. that um, yeah. states 
are all trying to reduce suspensions because that's, right. that's bad for them and yeah. uh, bad for the students being out of school, right? So um, yeah. what, what do the restorative practices look like there? Is it kind of a, a script that you're supposed to sort of follow that's as you talk question. to students about issues? Yeah, yeah. Um, we've had a big push lately for the um, – uh, the I can't remember. They call it something like along lines of like a justice circle, and that we actually have an. Uh, I don't think he's an administrator, but a, a person who's responsible for meeting with students who have started to have issues like that. And the students can voluntarily just say, "Hey, listen, can I go talk to this guy?" And they meet together in a particular place in the school and try to discuss it. But we've also got this other thing that's um, <coughs> we uh, I think it's during third period. Um, every couple of days and we just have a sort of uh, circle discussion with whatever third period class it is. And that is solely focused on um, developing uh, just communication skills, talking about things that are going on in the students' lives. And that, that occurs in every single class, um, which is, you know, also a pretty positive benefit. And it might speak to, um, uh, sort of why I, maybe why I haven't had so many fights in my, or any in my classes is because I, I sort of have that um, uh, that built into my classes in a way um, because I, I run it along the lines of sort of that St. John's approach of let's sit here and discuss ideas and I encourage the students to bring their personal um, uh, experiences into it if they feel comfortable doing so. So it sort of creates that environment of the uh, the justice circle, if, if that's the appropriate name for it. Yeah, that seems cool. And the kids actually buy into that. Some of them do. Some of them just want to get on their phones. Um, and some of them, you know, are sleepy and put their heads down. Um, but I've also found that the kids who do that don't always do that. Um, and every now and then they put up their heads and they listen and they even sometimes talk and and I, <laughs> I just count that as a win. Oh, definitely. I, I think it would have been really hard for me as a student to um, take that sort of thing seriously, I think, because yeah. I, I was never, I never wanted to like be demonstrably interested in anything that was done, <laughs> in, uh, except possibly like a book that I was reading, you know, like I was very mm -hmm. anti-social in that way. And, and so social, socializing um, that was like required by school, whether it be group projects or um, class discussions or anything like that. I, I just like checked out pretty much, um, you know, just, just, just because. Um, but like, so how, how can you, I guess, how can you um, try to develop um, like a better, a better kind of culture at the school? Is it sort of has it changed over the years that you've been there? Have you seen it get better, get worse uh, overall? And, and what kind of kind of steps can you take? And, and I don't know, maybe this is something that, um, you know, individual teachers have, have only so much to do with. And maybe it is more mm -hmm. of a, at the administrative level or, or you know, in the policy level, even if you're, you know, going into law, going into policy, potentially. Uh, yeah. what, what kinds of thoughts do you have about that? So actually, um, we had a PD on Monday, and that's it was something that we kind of was brought up, and something that I've actually have been thinking about the last couple of days. And I'll talk about how my Latin class has changed, because um, I think it sort of provides an answer to that question, um, or maybe, or you know, at least some insight. Um, when I started teaching it, uh, where I teach, they we used uh, I think it was the Cambridge book, and it was sort of that. Um, story approach where it's like we'll kind of point out grammar as we go and it's really kind of simple and it's not the sort of approach that you see in college to the Latin grammar of hey listen here's some rules now let's put those into practice and it's difficult because you you have to memorize things you have to you know master verb paradigms and uh, noun declensions and I was um, I learned the latter way I learned when I got to college even though I took Latin and high school and it was difficult. It was a great challenge. And so I started after my first couple years, I um, found out a way to get a copy of the Wheelock's textbook and um, started teaching the way I learned, which yeah. was a little more rigorous. And I started noticing that it was working. Um, 
And last year we finished Wheelox uh, in Latin two. I mean, you know, I mean, at, at a high school level, you know, so they didn't, you know, super master it, but, but we, you know, I gave the even a more difficult test than I had been giving. And for the first time in the seven years I had been teaching, uh, I did not have to curve my final, which was amazing. You know, as a high school teacher, it's like, I feel like I'm always curving things. Um, and it, it was fantastic. And what, something that I've noticed this year is that these students with this more rigorous approach, um, I still have, you know, I have philosophy Fridays. I'll have these uh, sort of my approach to the justice circles. And um, I've noticed that the, the kids are a little more open. And I think that rigor is, has got to be an incremental part of it. It's, it's got to be, they've got to be challenged, but they've also got to be challenged not only in um, a sort of a strict academic way, but also in that intellectual curiosity way. They've got to be posed questions like, hey, what's virtue? Or like I was teaching my world religion class today and we started Genesis and I, I said, well, hey, what is light? And the kids are like, wait, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and why is light good? And and they're like, oh, I've never thought about it. And um, when you can put those two together, I think that's really what most of modern education is missing. And what is it do you think about you that makes you think that that is a good way to spend your day? To like talk about ideas with young people who oh, yeah. often have behavioral problems. It's a very interesting yeah. way to spend your time. I mean, it's the best way to spend your time. I mean, it's obviously even better than what I plan to switch to with my career. It's by far the, the I mean, the superior like option for how uh, an, an adult can spend their time or anybody can spend their time. I mean, you're literally like fully engaging your entire being. You're challenging yourself and you're challenging somebody else to uh, come closer to the good. and you're maturing them in doing so. And it's making, literally making the world a better place because you're inspiring people to behave better and to pursue their intellect. All right. So now that you've done law school, you can probably answer this question, but um, you asked <laughs> it a minute ago, what, what is virtue or what is, what is justice? What is the good? Oof. Oh man. Um, well, you know, I think justice is that balance. I think it's that um, it's sort of, it's the, the aspect of interactions where we right wrongs. It's keeping things in check. I think that's the balance. It's the classic scales example. It's making those scales even after they've been unevened. I think that's what justice is, um, at least at a societal level, at a, at a legal level. I like that. Yeah. Think, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what's good? <laughs> the good. Oh, um, I was talking about this. Well, let's see. What well, which class was it? It was either philosophy or it was the world religion class. And um, I asked the students that it, I, it was the religion class. And I said, well, hey, you know, why does God uh, in Genesis? Why does he, uh, you know, say let there be light? And why does he say this is good? Why does he look at it and say that is good? And they, one of the students responded, well, it's beneficial. And that with that launched us down a, a whole. A long road of well, what does beneficial mean? Like, what is short-term beneficial versus long-term beneficial? Why do we have pleasures that are um, hedonistic, and why do we have pleasures that are um, intellectual, and and pleasures that benefit ourselves versus society? And um, I think that's the that's the real question of the capital G good is the summum bonum, the um, sort of utilitarian. What's not only short-term fulfilling um, because it's satisfying, um, but it's also uh, long-term, like in a theological, teleological sense, like towards society is that idea of fulfilling our civic purpose. That's uh, what, you know, Rousseau would have said, like in the Emil, where um, he talked about basically fulfilling yourself and um, also serving your society. Well, that's where teaching comes in is I think that that greatest occupation. Well then, so what is virtue and corollary, what is civic virtue? And could you mm. also spend a second, great Latinist that you are, telling us a little bit about um, Cato and what the Roman idea of civic virtue might have been through mm. 
Cato who said yeah. they're Pompeius Magnus. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I definitely think that we have a different concept of virtue today than, we, than the Romans did. Um, and that comes from the difference in the natures of our society, obviously. Uh, for the Romans, uh, for Cato, you, you had to, virtue was very much more of a, um, a building up your name. Uh, but I think that was beneficial at the time because if you were building up your name, you were fulfilling your role as a Roman. Um, and you were, you know, the, as the pater familias, you were um, uh, supporting your household. You were um, ideally becoming, you say, a, a, well, first a soldier, then a senator. You were, um, but that not only benefited you in getting your name out and building yourself a name, uh, it honored your family and it provided for your family and it provided for the city, the um, uh, res publica, you know, where we get our word republic. Uh, and I think in our modern day, I think it's interesting to look at what virtue is um, because it's, it's in a way still similar, but I, 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 I guess I'd, I, I'd really have to sit down and think about, um, you know, how it's, how it's different. Um, virtue might not necessarily, it's, I think there's perhaps more of a um, potential for sacrifice maybe. I mean, obviously the Roman would sacrifice, you know, his hand to show the enemy king <laughs> in the fire, uh, look how tough we Romans are to cause the king to surrender. That's certainly sacrifice. Uh, but um, I don't, hmm. that, yeah, the latter part, the, what, what virtue is, it, has it changed? I don't know. That's a question that I'd be just as interested to hear what you guys think um, as to try to figure out what I think about it. I'm not entirely sure. Well, I guess I would just because just to add another question to already a puzzling question, and maybe <laughs> Wes can, can do this for us too, but yeah. also knowing that you're a practicing Catholic, is there a difference between civic virtue and, say, Catholic virtue? Um, mm. um, but also, Wes, yeah, Wes, what do you think about virtue? What were you thinking about that question? I'm pretty interested. No, yeah. I, well, I asked, I asked to, mostly to, um, to try to, sort of practice a little bit of this, uh, this philosophical approach. And um, I know it's, it's a bit different when you have a room full of 30 or 20 or however many students. Um, but I think that the, the process of sort of this dialogue is a major part of any uh, possible answer to that question. Like that, that seems to me to be uh, not just the means to the end, but but something a lot like the end itself. Um, that that could just be my bias as again, like somebody who likes to do this sort of thing. Uh, but I, I'd say, you know, to even begin to answer these questions, you have to know a lot about history too, right? So um, the teaching of history is something that we haven't really talked about yet. Uh, we, we've touched on a, a bit about your your other classes, um, but you know, to have that kind of perspective on um, virtue as something which in some ways stays the same, right? There is something there that we can identify and yet in some ways shifts over time, right? The, the society, the culture, uh, the language perhaps all have a part to play in that. And whether there's progress or just, you know, differences that we can appreciate and sort of better understand ourselves through the lens of those differences, um, you know, either way, you, you've got to study and you've got to take the time to, um, to really look at uh, a lot of different historical sources to, to, to get a sense or like a, a, a way of beginning to ask and answer these kinds of questions. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, I know that the religious side of it, you know, is, is, is probably very important to a lot of your students as well. And, and maybe that complicates things a bit when, you, when you're talking about different religions and, and striving to be... Um, you know, fair and in, in, in addressing ones that you know well personally versus ones that you don't know as well personally, but only through mm -hmm. sort of study and such. But, um, but I think, you know, everybody, especially if they're at a young age um, and sort of going through a lot of things, everybody is concerned about uh, answering these questions. Maybe not like articulating the answers, but but mm -hmm. living them out. You know, and and I feel like that aspect of of history, of philosophy, of language, is is much too often uh, neglected, right? And so, you know, 
the, the lived out aspect of virtue is the much more important answer than the, the articulated, formulated, uh, polished, rhetorical uh, delivery of an answer, as much as I've you know, tried to give one. I completely agree. And Aristotle straight up says that in the ethics where he says it's much more important to practice virtue yeah. rather than to talk philosophically uh, about it. But that, that also makes me wonder, and I hope I don't lose my thought talking about Aristotle there. <laughs> um, uh, I, I probably will. The last bit that you just said, uh, the religious element and given an even handed bit and civic virtue. Oh no, I've lost it. Wes, I had this great connection. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's all good. What was the last right. thing you said? Just one more time. It might just pop back into my head. I'm. I, I don't know. I mean, I I was trying to kind of open oh, up that. Body. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to open up that question a little bit more, and and especially with ref, with reference to kids' understanding of history. Like that's yeah. that's a place that I I find I find that such a difficult subject to teach in an engaging way. Um, Okay. In, yes. In a, in a way that's that gonna hold their attention. Um, yeah. And and okay. So I know exactly what I was gonna say now um, because I've been listening to this terrible book called *Sapiens*, which is very popular now with an author whose name um, doesn't immediately come to mind, but it's very difficult to say. But he has some good prehistory and some good facts in there. It's uh, Yuval Noah Harari. I've got it on my desk yeah. right here. Yeah. And well, <laughs> the. Pr- one of the major problems with his book, besides the fact that his thesis is terrible, um, is that he sort of ascribes that sort of um, history just happens uh, idea to history. Like, oh, well, history just happened this way accidentally, as if, as if history is not actually the choices and conscious actions of humans. It's like, no, history does not happen by accident. History is made by people who make choices. In fact, that is how human life moves. So I think one of the problems with how we teach history is that we don't ascribe virtue to it and excellence. We don't recognize the great choices made by people, even though obviously history recognizes that, which is uh, not history, but rather the choices of those who embody and maintain the history, right? We as educators are constantly choosing what we are going to reanimate in our classrooms and bring back up. It doesn't just happen. Nothing just happens with us except for certain natural uh, and stellar facts, right? And so uh, to your point about uh, it being more important to embody excellence than to speak loftily about it, Wes, I take that entirely and think that history should be taught in a more uh, psychologically rigorous and um, teleologically informed way that people yeah. are always striving towards a better future. And I mean, something about that book, Sapiens, is it actually literally said, and I just have to blast it here, uh, that there are no measures by which you can judge human well-being <laughs> increasing over the course of history. And that's such a joke that I'm barely even going to think about it. <laughs> you know, you can measures of poverty, disease, war, famine, uh, death, uh, murder, those are all objective ones that the UN hits. So, you know, goodbye, bang, <laughs> nothing. Um, but I think adding that personal responsibility idea to history that you have a responsibility to make history and that history will, you know, reflect your actions as better or worse in some small way because you are so interconnected as a human. It's like we've, we've taken this intersectionality and individualism to such an extent that we believe we don't matter because we're not connected in any real and meaningful way to anything, including other people and what Mm -hmm. happened before us, rather than understanding that we are the most important thread in a very deep and giant carpet. And that, Mm -hmm. you know, everything that we do actually matters rather than everything that has happened, happened accidentally and will continue to happen anyway. I think that's a poisonous way Mm -hmm. of thinking. And yeah. I, I think that's why people hate history because they know that that's not how things actually are. It's like a bad mm-hmm. story. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I, I also think that, um, and this is something that it's, it's especially difficult, I think, for teaching history is sort of uh, going through, when I, when I do lessons in the history, of course, in Latin, I have to, I have, I 
have to bring them in. I enjoy bringing them in when I, when I do. Um, but I, that almost requires a lot more preparation than the language because the language I know, right. You know, I can talk about, um, you know, all the different cases or the tenses or the infinitive or whatever. But, um, when it comes to preparing, talking about, you know, the death of Caesar, like I've got to make sure that I've got that story lined up because to tell it to kids these days, you've got, it's almost like you're competing. You don't have to compete with the phones. Obviously you can, um, a lot of teachers are able to implement rigorous um, uh, uh, repercussions for having their phone out. But I, I, the way that I teach, it's, it's more of a, it's almost like I'm, I have to use my voice and I have to become, uh, you know, have that theater um, aspect of, of teaching where I'm, you know, telling the story in such a way that I'm trying to drag them in. And all, that always, almost always really works, except, unless the kid's having an absolutely horrible day. Um, and, and that's when I really feel like I'm, uh, I don't know, like on fire, like I'm really in the mode of teaching in those moments. And it's just, that's so much work and it's so hard to do and it takes so much preparation. And I know that were I to stick with that in the position I'm in, I would definitely burn out <laughs> sooner than later. It sounds like that's a very stoic principle of using minimum necessary force. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, first I, yeah. I so yeah, so I I guess the the crux of what I I want to ask you before we kind of wrap up here then is mm -hmm. is what do you what kinds of things do you do to help students um think about their futures then a, a, as far as it sounds like, you know, you're you're a role model for them. You you're teaching them of course um content but also sort of the way that you act in the world, the way that you run to the problem and, and form a human chain to, to keep the kids apart from fighting, right? So things like that, I think, are, are definitely important lessons as well. And, mm. and so the kids, the kids who look up to you and, you know, they know that you're going to go and become a lawyer and not be back to teach Latin next year or whatever it is, like, how, mm. how do you kind of break that to them? And, and how do you kind of help them uh, stand on their own two feet and, and think about their own yeah. futures and the kinds of choices they're going to need to make um, down the line. Yeah. Um, I, I always tell my story, to, certainly at least in my Latin classes, uh, my personal story, my struggle with Latin and being an undergrad and being told like my scholarships were under threat of take, being taken away because I wasn't doing well enough and my, my GPA was below 3.0 and going to my professor and, and, um, saying, hey, listen, I need some help. And they're like, hey, you might want to give up and switch majors. And <laughs> the struggle of going through four years of studying Greek one day and Latin the next, you know, like literally like 12 hours a day because I do not have an affinity for language. And, but coming out the other side and passing and getting an, you know, an honors degree in, in these subjects and, you know, telling the kids, hey, listen, I, it's, it's, it can be hard as heck. And sometimes it's not even what you want to do, but it's so worth the struggle because it, intelligence is not a static thing. It is fluid. And if you put the effort in, you can actually become more intelligent. And I'm not calling myself intelligent, but I, I'm definitely more intelligent than I was when I you know, went into any of the programs I've gone into. And, and I think that's crucial for, it was, it was crucial for me for helping me find you know, my, my purpose, my calling, how I fit into my society and my culture. And, uh, and the students need to have that too. There's a, uh, one of my favorite philosophers was actually a Jesuit priest in the fifties or he died in the fifties, Jacques Teilhard de Chardin. And he wrote a number of different books, but one was, um, the Omega point. And he talked about this idea. If I, you know, if I can summarize it correctly, that, uh, humanity is working toward this Omega point. And for, Chardin, that was, and I'm probably butchering his name, it's from the French. Um, he, uh, uh, it, it was this uh, sort of like convergence with God. It was technology, it was human development, it was human maturation, spiritually, intellectually, everything. And that was a point where we would reach this like convergence with God, like that singularity idea, but it's divine as well. And I think that's, it's, that I, I mentioned that in my classes, but that's always in the background of my mind when I'm teaching the students that you can find fulfillment that uh, I don't know what the, the Eastern term Ikagi is, but like um, finding their, their job, but what they're good at and what they find meaning in and what they get paid for and how that all fits into the, 
that sort of teleological end goal of how we're moving humanity forward. And I think that's what education is so crucial for. And that's really what I'm, I don't know that I do a good job of it, but I try to, to sort of implement that mentality into the spirit of my classes every day. Gosh, thanks so much for your time, David. Um, yeah. Alex, do, you have, do you have any final thoughts or questions or call well, this one good? For I, I have one little question. One little question. I, I meant to ask it just now without leaving that pause, but I couldn't bring it immediately to mind. You have a hypnotic way of speaking, Oldham. Is, you know, you're very, I would listen to you in a class. Uh, you, should rec- you should definitely record publicly. Um, nice. But um, you, you said something about knowing what your place is in the world. Mm. And so we sort of started that question but didn't finish it. But what is your place in the world, teacher or lawyer? Gosh. Uh, uh, ideally, I'd teach law school. <laughs> um, All right, so rising to the teaching aspect in whatever it is you do. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. As if teaching well, I, is the highest calling. <laughs> it is, without a doubt, without a doubt. It's that for parents, it's for um, artists, it's for high school, grade school, college teachers, it's, it's the highest calling. Well, uh, what what finer words to end on than those, Mr. Wesley Schatz? <laughs> right on. Hey, thanks again. And um, we'll have you back anytime that you are not uh, breaking up fights or uh, <laughs> uh, we're glad to have you back on the, the. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I, it's, it's good to hear from you guys. It's good to talk to you. I miss you all. And it's a, it's a, Good to talk to you. Well, it's fantastic on this end too. And uh, well, you know, we'll talk about this maybe personally, but Nashville may not be too far in the future. I'm not trying to promise what I can't deliver, but who knows? Dude, anytime. We, well, we'd, I'll be here and uh, be awesome. Awesome to have you. You too, Wes. All right. I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll put it into my, my very busy schedule here, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> when I can make it, I'll be down. Good. All right. Good. All right. See you guys. All right. Night. See y'all later. <laughs>